drove in here and I was like, Dave, what do you think that, um, what do you think Jesus wants to do tonight in class? <laughs> Literally, as soon as I got the question out of my mouth, <laughs> I started laughing. He's like, what? I said, as soon as I asked the question, I heard Jesus go, I want to come in like a wrecking ball. <laughs> Last year, 
I'm, I'm pretty sure she's here right now, but there before. So down at the bottom it says, in memory, Julie Giles, matriarch, revivalist, student, teacher, mother, daughter, smiler, hugger, friend. You adopted us with your smile and love, left us a legacy with your love. And th those words are words that mean Alicia may know about her. Those are words that we hear people speak about her. And they even this else. Julia's next mother. But um, when I sat behind you on Sunday, I saw. What did I see? See, I was like, I'm going to give this to him in class on Tuesday. It's going to be awesome. I should have written it down. And I just heard the thought of, I heard the thought of, he's the one that's going to pull the sword and help us down. Yeah. And so there's always been this idea because people long for chivalry, chivalry they long for nobility. And <clears throat> only the heart, it says it's the glory of God to conceal a man, but the glory of the kings to search it out. Because kings are drawn into the mystery into the discovery of fun. And when they when they get there, they're the ones I think because of that noble heart are able to grab hold of that thing which is hidden and pull it out. Not only there it is, a lot of people are able to say there it is, they're able to identify it, but they're not able to take it and use it. So I feel like that's you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. 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 Alright. So we're actually going to start at the beginning this week instead of going to the mystics, <laughs> which will be next week. Um, so flip over to page seven. Actually, keep going. I'm still not going to go over it, but this is kind of how, again, I used to, we, we put it together as we kind of taught it. And so there's things in here all over the place that you can read. Actually, let's skip over to the matriarchs. I'm sorry, the patriarchs. I'm going to tell a hot start to me. We're coming like a wrecking ball, Jesus. The, the thing is, is that one of the reasons I love revival history so much is because we're talking about people who can fill timelines, who can fill a notebook, who lived their lives in such a way that the unseen reality was more alive and more present in their life than this podium is. It was more real than the clothing that they were wearing. It was more real than the air that they were breathing. And because of that, that reality bled through their life into the earth. If you like that one, it's fancy. This comes to me after class. If you buy it today, we'll bring more next week. <laughs> but they're really cool. Man, guys, like, you're doing so good that you're trying to sell us a poster. <laughs> so, talking about the heavenly reality, it's one thing to say heaven on earth, but what does that actually begin to look like? That's the reason we kind of painted the class with Hebrides. We kind of set it up there. You know, where the veil between the spirit, I mean, we have people who are seers, you know, like Snow is a seer. Well, if everyone in all of our seers were seeing this, like, other kingdom, that our earthly realm was actually more of a hologram on top of the heavenly realm that surrounds us. So it transforms from this idea to a reality that we can live and breathe and interact with. If, if the definition of revival is restoring creation to the cosmos, the original plan and design of God, then what does God see when he looks at the earth? What does the city of Atlanta look like from his perspective? You know, I was driving through Atlanta one day, and I was coming from the north side of the perimeter down towards us, right? You know? So if you're driving on the connector, there's a whole wall of skyscrapers on the left side, if you're in Midtown, but then over here, there's like Georgia Tech and, you know, Atlantic Station, but there's not much. So I was driving down through the city, and I looked over, and I saw skyscrapers all on the right side. I was like, that's 
pretty early because I knew like really there wasn't any skyscrapers there. And then I said, or then I asked my spirit for the interpretation, and I felt like he said that um, he said something. <laughs> something along the lines of having the capacity to build the Atlanta that you want to see. One of the things that really speaks to me is um, Epcot Center. Epcot Center is stands for Experimental Prototype City of Tomorrow. It was designed to be a city that was futuristic. And then it became a theme park. How many moves of God started that way and ended that way? And so when I, when I hear people talk about the future, they're peering into the future and what that looks like. See, the problem with a lot of the revivals, even some of the ones that were in the study, is, is they had no grid for the future because there was an eschatology in place that said there wasn't a future. So the hope for tomorrow became the hope to get somewhere through the gateway of death that Jesus has already opened the gateway for us for relationship with him. Does that make sense? And so that can begin, if you begin to have a grid for not only the presence of God, but what comes with his presence, you'll begin to see cities and people the way God intended them. You know? Does the present Atlanta look like the Atlanta that is designed in heaven? And if you're able to see those blueprints and come back to the earth with those blueprints, then you're able to move the word of wisdom. This is not a perfect class day. Come on. Sorry. Yes, tracking. Sorry, good thing. Yes, tracking. So good. Choo choo. All right. So when you first hear about this reality, it could be the, the you know the introduction to kingdom culture. It could be you know seeing someone get healed. It could be a prophetic song you heard somewhere. It could be a series of meetings. But it's like something you've never heard or seen before it comes alive for the first time. Who's seen Equilibrium? Nobody seen Equilibrium? That's a, it's it's kind of, it came out at the same time that Matrix did, but Matrix kind of overshadowed it. Matrix is pretty red too, I like it. But, um, so I'm going to show you a clip from this movie. So in this movie, they're not allowed to use their senses. They can't feel. They can't love. They can't have emotion. They can't look at something like art and get an emotional response to it. They can't hear something like music and get an emotional response to it. And they would be drugged up every day at the same time to desensitize the, the emotions. Well, if you read about the life of Jesus, if you just hear the voice of our Papa in the language he uses throughout Scripture, it's very emotional. Emotions are bad, as you hear in first year scenario, Justin was just talking about some of them. They can derail your life if you let them rule you. But part of the reasons emotions can be so deadly is because we don't give them any place to actually grow and express. Does that make sense? So in this movie, there's this world where people are emotionless. And so that man, I mean, Christian Bale. <laughs> discovers a room where someone had like, you know, different types of art and stuff displayed around. So check this out. And so he's never ever like seen art or heard music before. And so this is the first time he's had this experience. I think you gotta close the PowerPoint and then pull up the or to minimize that.
our life. A snowball is something we've seen moves from something that's ordinary to something that's majestic. Jeremiah's walking along. And almost like the sound of the music, you get stopped. The Lord says, Jeremiah, what do you see? He says, I see the bud of an olive tree. He said, you've seen well. Christian Bale stops. He sees a snowball. He's so majestic and ordinary. Like I said last week, the secret to faith to move a mountain isn't trying to become a mountain of belief into a mustard seed. Slicking it in the mustard seed and saying, that's enough for me to start. That right there is enough for me to take a step. And to notice what most people don't. The kingdom is available to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. On board tracking. So one of my favorites is Smith Wigglesworth. Who's heard of Smith Wigglesworth? Everybody. He was known as the Apostle of Faith. Now this book, we're not going to get to everything. I'm not going to try that. I'll try it in the past, and then it just becomes like what our teaching. And what whether we want, we want information, we want experience, we want activation, right? And so we're going to kind of hit some stuff a little bit deeper, some stuff we're going to skip over, some stuff we're just going to say quickly. But Smith was known as the Apostle of Faith. He didn't pronounce his H's. So, for example, one time someone came up for prayer. I think the guy had stomach cancer. So Smith wound his arm up. Make sh he made sure he got a good wind up and just punched him right in the gut. The guy fell over. And they're like, you've killed him. And Smith is like, he's not dead. He's healed. <laughs> he's healed. He couldn't pronounce his H's. So he was a plumber and a part-time minister until 1907 when he got powerfully baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're going to bring some stuff on the last night, some of the books, some of the recommended reading that we have in the back of the book. But this is a big, fat, great book. It has the complete collection of uh, his life teachings. Who's seen that? It's still available. I think it might have changed the color of it now since they changed publishers. But, um, and so the way he talks about being baptized in the Spirit is like this liquid fire like pouring down from heaven and pouring all over him. That's in my book, isn't it? Is that what you're at? Oh. No, I'm thinking of like, I'm sorry. I'm really prepared for something. So. Actually, I got up all excited and on fire ready for, uh, to come to class tonight. And then I got sick to my stomach. Sick to my stomach for about half a day. But... Well, the craziest thing happened. 
I was on the second story uh, in my home on the catwalk and I had a, a noose around my neck. And just as I went to take a step off to kill myself, someone yelled John 316 through the keyhole. Isn't that crazy? Uh, another story is he got called to pray for a woman who had passed away. So he goes to his funeral home with this extreme etiquette. He walks over, he picks the body up out of the casket, brings it over to the wall, pushes it against the wall, and says, Walk! He steps back, curb him. Puts the body back up, stands against the wall, and says, Walk! Her plunk, like a sack of potatoes, right? Just you know, hope, like hopefully, like they do come back, they don't have broken arms or broken busted teeth, right? <laughs> Picks the body up a third time, says walk, and it, the lady steps out, and begins walk, and so they're like, "What happened?" She's like, "I was in heaven speaking with Jesus." That's like glorious, and she was describing like this a beautiful creation. And then I heard some guy yelling, walk. <laughs> and so he was just known for having faith. I mean, you could not convince him that God would not move. It just would not happen. He went to San Francisco, I forgot what year, and, um, Francisco, Elf like that word? Francisco. <laughs> Donnie's like, I made the right decision to come to this class. <laughs> he thought it was bad. I was trying to coach people on moves and crossfit out, did he? Um, okay, so many people showed up in San Francisco that the meeting grounds they were going to have the meeting in, they just told him to line up down the street, right? So he just began walking down the street, preaching gospel, praying for people. And as many people that got his shadow were people. Remember that before? We spend our life in His presence, and His presence becomes our presence. When they get in our presence, they feel His presence. And what happens in His presence? Sickness does it. Sin does it. Disease does it. Death does it. You know? It's, it's the acclamation to a heavenly life that for years, even some of the, the precious saints here only saw partly but we've reserved for another age that has already been freely given to us. Right? And so that's why I love the revivalists is because you can see people who saw bits and pieces of that age and said, no, that's mine for my generation. My favorite story of his, it's right here in the third point, says, some people say it was in Australia, some other stories say New Zealand. I think the two countries might have been testimony. So they had a meeting, and leaders from all over the country came together to pray. And Smith was in there with them. And one by one, they went around the room. I think there was 12 ministers in total. Right? And so they all began to, they, you know, they went in order, they were nice and polite. It wasn't a total Pentecost blowout. Who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah. If you don't, we'll maybe try it a little bit. <laughs> but, um, and so when it was Smith's turn, he lifted his hands to heaven and began to do what he always did. He began to pray. And after a few moments, the light got so bright and the heat got so intense that one by one, the other ministers had to leave the room. Now it wasn't saying that they weren't spiritual. It's just what happens in his secret life. We read about all the public stuff. The things that were going on behind closed doors, our heavenly things, began to leak out in public. And it became so intense that the people who were in the room were not able to acclimate. I've, I've heard, I've had friends do it. Um, <laughs> when I was in Bible school, my friends, my friends right now, they were roommates. Brian was sitting here, and Adam was sitting across from him. This is at Brownsville. And they were fasting, you know, I think they were like three or five days into it. Just hanging out, right? 
And so now we're sitting across from him, and he's trying to get his alarm clock to work. You know, he took it apart and tried to fix it. And Brian half jokingly walked over to the alarm clock and said, Fire! And it started working immediately. Wow. So they sit back down. And as soon as they sit down, they lock eyes. Like, you ever know, like, all of a sudden, you're not alone. Like, it's something. I mean, it could be with God, it could be with something else, you know. All of a sudden, you're, you're, you recognize something. You know, who knows what the word terror means? Terror. It just means to be in the presence of something bigger and more powerful than yourself. Who knows what the word monster means? supernatural. But over time, because of different worldviews, the word monster became associated more with what? Darkness. And that's what everything that means. I'm just going all over the place. I don't know if she's late. <laughs> Ever and ever means Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Hebrew. Yeah. I'm not saying that to validate the use of magic. I'm saying that to show you how the supernatural is always been present, but because of beliefs, it began to be diluted and they were reoriented back to the occult, to the enemy. Does that make sense? I'm not giving you permission or telling you to go around saying ever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting to see some of the etymologies of some of these words and their true origin. I mean, I saw a YouTube video where the lady's like, the monster energy, energy drinks the market beast. She was going on all this stuff. It's not. It's a caffeine drink. You know? um, so they're sitting there across from each other, and they all of a sudden they became aware of a presence much greater than themselves. And they looked, and they locked eyes, and they said, Jesus is in the room. And then holy terror hit them, like holy fear. Not like, i got to run away from something bad entering. It's like, I don't know if I can remain in the environment with so much goodness. See the difference? So Jesus walks in front of them, and he stops right between them. And they just begin to like shake and black eyes, and they're staring at each other. And he keeps walking, and he goes into the kitchen, turns back around. This is like a little villa, so like on one side you had like the living room, kitchen, and then like shotgun style on most, the other side was like the three bedrooms. So he walks back around, in between them, and they can tell he went around and back into the bedrooms. And they came back out, went around, and they stopped right in front of them. And they don't know how long he was there. But they're sitting there. And they're in they're in revival. They're at Brownsville. God's moving all around them. You'll hear someone and see someone that, about that in a minute. But um, it became so intense. Brian finally said, kept it. That was just Brian finally said, Jesus is too much and can't take it. Would you please leave? So Brian's telling the story one day at Denny's. Denny's was kind of known for some of the crazies going just right down the street from Brownsville. Well. And so we kind of go there often. So he's in there. I mean, this guy is just animated. He's the most on fire person for the Lord I've ever met in the 20 years in the Apple movie. But he's sitting in there with a group of us and he begins to tell the story for people who haven't heard it. And he's all animated, big fat goatee. He's got that look in his eyes where you can't stare at him. He's like, and with tears streaming down his face, he goes, I asked him to leave. I'll never, ever do that again. And so they're, they're wailing in ditties. And I look like, oh my gosh, they're so loud. <laughs> <laughs> like, totally embarrassed. And I don't usually get embarrassed. I was like stone cold frozen, like, I'm gonna pick my head up and have an audience. Like, you know, it's totally not in the zone. And so finally, like after like 20 or 30 more minutes, they calm down. And so I'm like, okay, cool. Let's get up. Let's exit out of here. <laughs> and then Jesus goes, I think it'd be a really good idea if you told everyone in the restaurant, restaurant what just happened. I said, I don't think that's a really good idea. <laughs> He goes, no, really, I think you should preach to everyone and explain to them what happened. And then I just, you know, I was like, I kind of laughed. I looked over at Brian. I was like, I think God wants me to preach right now. Ha, ha, ha. And then it was like, 
not like Smith, he didn't say, oh, you know, it wasn't like, like, do this now or die type of thing, because that's not the nature of the Father. But we receive his nature through the grid of who we think he is. Everybody about that? So you might be like, well, God did this, God's mad at me, this is his nature. You know, that's what you perceive his nature when his action transpired through your personality. So anyways, and that's why I was Smith. I, I don't think God was starting to never use him again. I think he was giving him urgency in the way Smith translated that for himself was like to capture the moment. Does that make sense? And um, so, <laughs> I think I'm 19 or 20. I know I don't look like I'm too much older than you. Right? <laughs> they were 22. Um, I say, have your attention. And I was like, I was hard, man. I was like, fire, fire, everywhere. I mean, I was hunting down people smoking cigarettes. I was doing everything wrong, right? It's like, are you burning for Jesus? You know? <laughs> but the cool thing is, is that when I got embarrassed, that, that derailed that pattern that I was used to. And so I stood in front of the people vulnerable. Does that make sense? It's kind of like I explained earlier. Instead of standing here with the encounter waiting, all of a sudden, somehow I stumbled into the encounter and I was left defenseless. And my only resource was the Holy Spirit that moment. And so it was 30 seconds. I just want you to let you guys know we love God so much. We're passionate. That's why we just could not contain ourselves at that table. And just, Jesus loves you so much. Thank you for your time. So in the middle of my speech, it's backwards, but my poster's there. I'll knock it over. Uh, I was on that side. So I'm over there by the podium talking. This dude comes running out of the kitchen. I mean, he was full on, like, I stepped back. I thought, it's about to go down. Like, this is it. Like, you know. So I got my ready stance, right? You don't just stand there and take a hit. Like, and he stops right before he gets to me. Like, someone smacked him in the face with a frying pan, like a bug's bunny. And just turned around and just walked right back into the kitchen. Craziest thing. I have no idea what the guy's doing. When we read about encounters like this, when I read about Smith doing this, I had the same reaction that this young man had. The story went around. He thought to himself, if this ever happens again, I'm going to be the one in purgatory if he doesn't leave. And you ever notice how like, you go through a whole bunch of things that seem like coincidence, but within like random, like, totally random. So come, and then I'll bring them to go this way. I'll go over here. And there's a little kid crying. I give the kid chocolate. And then the mom says, oh, I just thought, well, God, if you're real, we'll have someone give my kid chocolate. And you're like, oh, I was just making random decisions, right? <laughs> and then you look back and say, that was the divine plan of God. It causes all things to work together for us. Makes no matter decision, you, whatever decision you could possibly make, the worst thing you've ever done times ten, he still has redemption woven into that. Right? If we really believed about ourselves, but he believed about us, we'd probably all be floating right now. <laughs> and so the young man's there, they're all circled up, and the same thing begins to happen. One by one, they go around the room. Including the young man. Then Smith prays. One by one, they begin to leave the room. Until it's just Smith letting his secret plays out. And this young man falls to his knees. And he falls to his stomach. And then finally, it's too much. Just start crawling out of the room. Yeah. Now we'll give it to Jim. When, when the glory hit the room that day, we were talking about in here. I looked over, Jim was walking crawling towards the front. Like she wasn't crawling out, she was like, I've got to get closer. <laughs> and then afterwards, I was like, What were you doing, walking crawling? She's like, It just felt like a, a good thing to do at the time. <laughs> But the young man was sitting right here, and I said, who wants it? And as soon as I said that, he leans back in his chair, he begins to shake and vibrate. He comes up about, about this time there, who was here? And he comes over about this far, probably, I don't know, somewhere here, hits the ground. 
I didn't have language for that for two years. The craziest thing, he started shaking so much, he went over three feet and landed. And then later on, like, he actually lifted up, floated sideways and hit the ground. See how the mind has tricks on you? You see it happen. But you don't dare to let yourself describe it that way because then you enter into the opportunity for someone to label you as a mystical lunatic who stands on street corners. <laughs> and the goal isn't to be so powerful in prayer that people have to live the room. It's when you pray, things actually happen. When Smith would begin to pray, pray the veil that blinded people from seeing the heavenly reality that was already there began to move, get removed. And their natural, their natural membranes weren't ready for it, although they were designed to experience it. Are you guys okay? Yeah. You try. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I really got to get moving now. John G. Lake. There he is. This guy's epically amazing as well. Uh, long history, he also has a big fat book. Just, you know, go through some research. Did they give you God's journals this year, or do you have to find them? First year, what do you have? Okay, well, God's journals is a really good resource for it. Um, and again, there's more regular, recommended reading in the back. Uh, long story short, his whole family, like he had like 16 brothers and sisters, eight of them died of sickness. Um, his wife got sick, he took her up to John Alexander Dowry where she was miraculously healed. And he, not even knowing how to pray for healing, when people heard that his sister got healed, they started showing up at his house to get healing. You know? Talk about a testimony. Hey, we're here to be healed. Okay. <laughs> so he had to learn kind of how to do it on his own. Well, later on in Spokane, Washington, he began to activate people through divine healing technician training. One of the first ones to do it. Um, we're going to get to the voice of healing in a minute, but in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, it would be one minister here with a line of people, and they would stand there for 10 to 12 hours at a time while thousands of people cycle through the one person and pray for them. Some awesome, amazing, incredible testimonies like that began to happen. But then you get into John Wimber, then you get Bill Johnson, and people begin to activate everyone else to do it. And so John G. Lake had a ministry known for like masses of people because he was actually activating the masses. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now both are needed. Like we can look back at people who stood in front of large crowds and they become an exclamation point in history. But remember that exclamation point is actually an invitation for you to do what they did. He feels like he's supposed to be, he's a really successful businessman and sells everything. He feels like he's supposed to go to South Africa. And so, like, with his last, like, few bucks, he, he gets his whole family, a big family, wife and kids on the boat, and they arrive in South Africa without even enough money to get off the docks. Because once you get off the boat, you have to go through customs, right, to get into the country. But they charge the fee. He had no money. So he's sitting there. He can't get back on the boat because he doesn't have any money. He can't go into the country. He's about to have a really effective talk ministry, right? <laughs> a lady who's never ever heard of him or anything, she just, God told her, go down to the docks. There's a guy named John G. Lake down there with his family. Um, you're going to give them that house that you're using and pay for them to get established in the country. Walks into the docks. Hi, right, you're John G. Lake? Yep. Okay, I have a house for you. Come on with me. I'll take care of everything. <laughs> So, I mean, he, he's preaching there. All kinds of amazing things are happening. The Bible's breaking out. And this is where John G. Lake, like, he was real scientific. Whereas Smith was just like, he's evil. Devil, get out of my way. He doesn't punch people. He's punching the devil, right? Uh, do not do that. A couple other people are kind of known for doing that. Um, I'm not telling you the Bible like God. I'm just saying, like, if, you're, if you have the kind of prayer ministry and and die hard faith that Smith has, then I won't stop because of that. <laughs> but until then, we're going to be on the long practice that again. Because it's not the form, it's the spirit, right? And so I got some of these crazy miracles of, of John, kind of point four. Um, who's heard of the bubonic plague? Bad stuff, right? 
And so they, they were out in the field. They, he was with a the scientist. They took saliva out of a cadaver, put it in his hand, and then looked at it under the microscope, and the disease died in his hand. One time he was riding with his friend, and he got, caught some kind of virus, and like got real sick, fell over on his horse. And they thought he was dead. And so John didn't stop it right away because he was wanting just to see what would happen. And so finally, when like it looked like he should probably step in, he, I don't know if he raised the man from the dead or just like from homeless being dead. You know, like he had so much faith that, like, like what his friends like, bro, come on, man, you let me fall off the horse. He's like, I just wanted to see what was going to happen. <laughs> Well, what if God didn't move? Well, you couldn't say that to John Julie because he didn't think like that. Like, what do you mean God wouldn't move? Like, one time a lady came into his office and said, I really need prayer for healing, but I don't have any faith. He pushes back from his desk and smiles and said, that's okay, I've got enough faith for both of us. And remember, it's, it's just like, what if that action right there activated his faith? What if he was feeling down on that? Who knows? You, you have to move out of who you think you are and step into who Jesus says you are. So one day, he's in a village meeting with some pastors. <laughs> you guys ready? And uh, one, one of the pastors, you know, most of the people leave through the door. Well, this gentleman just, you know, gets up, crawls out the window, and flies away. And he looked around the room like, what was that? And they're like, oh, he's known as the flying saint. <laughs> they didn't have a Western worldview telling them that the Bible says you can't do that stuff when it's full of it. And so this guy just happened to read something somewhere one day about somebody going out and thought, well, I can do that too. What's that guy's name? That guy? Yeah. The flying saint? I don't know if they ever even saw him again. You know, some brother in South Africa. I don't know, maybe he never even came down. <laughs> oh, man. I gotta work on this bending time thing. Oh, well, then, okay, so that happens. So he's praying one day. They're in a prayer meeting. The report comes about a lady who's connected to someone in the mission down there. About a lady in Wales who's suffering from demonic oppression. So they all stand in the circle and begin to pray for her. So from the people's perspective, John lights up like a light bulb, kind of like Smith did. But they just kind of stay there like, okay, this is shocking. Right? I don't know what the reaction was. And... Um, but what was happening with John, so they can't see him in the room, right? They physically can't see him, it's just light. From John Jalek's perspective, he's all of a sudden flying around the, the horn of South Africa. He's flying up the coast. He flies past the rock of Gibraltar. And he's flying over the countryside of Wales and notices certain landmarks. He comes down in front of the asylum, Recognizes a peculiar looking doorbell, goes into the asylum, walks into the room, casts a demon on the girl. Next thing, next moment, he's back inside. <laughs> when he went back to the States, he actually took a ship that went up the coast to verify it. He was experiential, but he was also very scientific. He used to give thousands and thousands of words of knowledge. Well, he had no idea if they were true or not because it was worth knowledge. And this didn't exist. Back there. He couldn't Google it. So he would correspond with a friend who worked at the Smithsonian over like six month period to test his word of knowledge. Like six months later, oh that was that was true? Wow. <laughs> so he claimed to have walked in power that wasn't present in the earth for two thousand years. He said that when God knew it was like lightning in his hands. Now I studied this story for like twenty years thinking. It must have felt like electricity. But I'm trying to take some of the stuff the saint says. It could have been metaphorical. It could have been. But what if it wasn't? What if it was literal? What if that guy's hands would light up like 
Although you saw a picture last week of Catherine Coleman, right? Who was not here last week? You guys are trapped, that's good. But, um, I mean, who knows? So, all right. So those are the patriarchs, John G. Lake, Smith, Wigglesworth, and we did the Ever Roberts last week. So now we're going to back up. And we are going to accelerate through the, ninth, the 20th century. Stand up real quick. Put your hands out. Jesus, give me the faith of Smith Wigglesworth. Give me the audacity of John G. Lake. Give me the spirit that believes before I think. That's how you upgrade thinking. You don't upgrade your thinking by thinking about it. Fire. All right, sit down. Sit down before we all start floating. No, no please. Do you feel gravity to get the week? All right. You guys good? We have about 35 more minutes ish. I'm going to hit the next two really quick so I can get the microphone to my wife. So I always do this to her. Sorry, I don't <laughs> Who's heard of Charles Fox Parham? Couple. He was known as the father of modern Pentecost. Similar story, he was sick when he was a kid, then he got miraculously healed, then he got sick again, and then he was like bummed out because he wanted to preach the gospel, and then he heard the he heard the Lord say, or some verse or something that says something like, Physician, heal thyself, and that inspired him. So he prayed for his own self to get healed, and he gets healed. When he was like 19 or 17 or 13, I don't know how old he was, that's my notes. He goes up on the mountainside and looks down at the valley that covers his hometown, and he just reached out his, hand, reached out his hands and said, God, take the valley for your kingdom. And so he pretty quickly begins to get known for having an amazing healing ministry. So he opened a healing school in Topeka, Kansas called Bethel. And so people began to come to the home. And they would spend you know, a few days in the home um, just in the atmosphere where faith was prevalent. And so over a period of days, they would end up getting healed right. And then he opens up a Bible school. I left you in the last Jason, I'm sorry. He opens up a Bible school called uh, Stone's Folly. And he gives his students an assignment. He says, I'm going to be gone for a couple of days, but I want you to tell me what the evidence is in Scripture for speaking in tongues. For the baptism of the Spirit. I'm sorry, I just told you the answer. So he comes back in a couple of days, and they say, well, the evidence for the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Now, that was their conclusion, and it still is a prevalent doctrine in much of Pentecostal charismatic theology. Um, I, I don't think that's the only evidence. I mean, you prophesy, you're healing the sick, raising the dead. I've heard of people do that if they got baptized in the Spirit, as far as speaking in tongues. Um, that, that language is present inside of you, just like healing is present inside of you. I got filled with the Spirit and shook violently for an hour and a half, six months before I spoke in tongues. Had crazy visions of the Holy Spirit entering the people in body and driving out black stuff. If someone had been able to guide me in that moment, I would have been able to unlock my prayer language. Does that make sense? So I was definitely baptized in the Spirit then, but it didn't actually come until I was in high school. And then came in high school and I couldn't stop. So like I went back to class, sat down, and said, oh, I like I just couldn't, couldn't turn it off. It was pretty wild. But I'm not going to tell you that story because I have to keep on track. And so, Agnes Osmond was the first to be baptized in the, in the Holy Spirit. She could speak Chinese, read, and write perfectly. That's a baptism of the Spirit. I don't, I don't know Chinese. It's an invitation for me to learn it. I don't know Chinese. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. Part of this is rhetorical. I'm actually trying to make jokes. 
Oh, that explains a lot. I'm like, <laughs> sing and laugh. Have you guys ever tried to sing and laugh? Just try it. <laughs> It 
says, Mothers of Azusa, Neil Terry, suggested the Seymour go to L.A. Lucy Farrow, invited by Seymour, brought the baptism of the Holy Spirit to L.A. Jimmy Evans Moore was his wife and carried out the mission after his death. African American man and three African American ladies. If you, who has not heard of the ladies? We would not be in this room without those three ladies. If you trace the history, which is what we're going through now, at time would just stop and be really awesome. So, so he goes to LA and they hear about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because he carried that from the spiritual father Charles Parham, right? He gets out there, but he hasn't experienced it yet. So he calls out uh, Lucy Farrell to bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit to LA before he even gets baptized in it. So God begins to move on Bonnie Bray Street. So many people crowd to this little big house that they have to move down the street to this abandoned horse stable on Azusa Street. And so that's where they began to meet. And LA at the time had a bunch of immigrants, just like New York did coming from Europe. LA had a lot of immigrants coming from Asia. So William Seymour goes from a place in Texas to where he had to sit outside to a place in LA where the world was literally coming to him. All nations, all races. Yeah. And they would come in and they would experience God in a powerful way and they would experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it, that actually launches the worldwide Pentecostal movement. So you have a, a father, Parham, who steps out in faith, faith enough to allow in his time something that was radical to have students listen in. And then one of those students goes to LA and changes the face of the planet. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but one of the things they did in LA, they called each other brother and sister. Do you ever hear that church? You're just kind of like, you know, that sounds old school, like I'm not your brother, you know? You ever hear that? Well, the reason they did it in Susan Street for the very first time was to show that we had no distinction. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. It was all family. Does that make sense? And so to get ready for the meetings, he would often sit up, sit in front of everyone. Like he came into class, and I decided to, you know, do something like this. And, and you guys are like, "Are you a teacher? What?" It smells like Panera. <laughs> but he wouldn't come out from under the box until God. The glory was there. Right? There was no time was an uh, impediment to the glory. Now we honor, we do things like that. Some of the revivals in history didn't have a good, didn't have good boundaries and they burn out, right? So I mean the glory clouds were so amazing, so thick in their times the kids would like, you know, catch like the glory that was like lit up and like glowing and like you know, put it in jars, and you have a jar full of glory cloud that's like iridescent and illuminating. Crazy stuff, man. So we fast forward from there, we're going to skip through Hebrides. And then we go to the Voice of Healing movement. I talked about that a little bit. We talked a little bit last um, week about William Brandon and some of his crazy stories. You have Oral Roberts, you have Gordon Lindsay, you have all these amazing faith healers of the 50s and 60s. Um, I keep going, fast forward. People used to think, that picture was little David Walker. They used to think he was levitating when the family came out and said, no, he was actually jumping. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Oh, stop there. All right. So you have 1900 all the way up to us today. Now we're going to connect the dots of this century and show you how you actually fit into this book. Come on, let's see.
with him in the service, and and he just is trying to read the Bible, and he just gets so overwhelmed by God that he just, it literally looks like he's just a drunk man. He can't even um, get through his words. And then the next thing you know, you everybody's in the in the church just starts getting completely wrecked, and you can hear the angel at our house. Um, so anyhow, he his services were just that just was common. They they nicknamed him the the Holy Spirit bartender uh, just because it, there was just so much joy and laughter when he was around. Um, but that ties in. I, I'm so fascinated by how I, how I, all this ties in, like from the Jesus movement all the way up until like us here today. Um, who knows Randy Clark? Randy Clark. Okay. Randy Clark um, was actually a big part of the Toronto Revival. And Randy actually, in 1983, he was so burnt out. He was literally at the end of himself. Um, he actually really, he says this on the video that he literally hated his church. He was the pastor. <laughs> he was just so burnt out and tired of the mundane. And he was just at the end of his, himself, and on that, like, the night of his deepest, like, woes, I guess, um, his friend calls, and he said, hey, I just went to this service by this guy, Rodney Howard Brown. I really feel like you should go to this. And so he's like, well, I don't have anything to lose. So he takes a few of his staff, hops on a plane, and I think they go over to Texas and um, to these Rodney and Howard Brown meetings, right? And so the first night he's there and he's just kind of observing and he was just not sure, like people rolling around, he just was not sure about it. And Rodney had a style of ministry where he would only pray for people if they were like feeling the anointing that night. And so um, at the end of the service he would say, if you're feeling something in your, in your body, if you're feeling, actually feeling the anointing, come up here, I will pray for you. So that first night, Randy didn't feel anything. I think one of his uh, staff felt something and got up and got prayer. And, and so Randy was just kind of watching and, and was just a, a true skeptic. And then um, that night they were walking back to the hotel and his friend that had gotten blasted um, was just like so drunk walking back to the hotel. So the next night, um, uh, they're there again and Rodney says the same thing. If you're feeling something, um, come, up, come up here. And Randy felt something, and so he was like, oh, I felt something. So he runs up front, gets prayer, still a skeptic, um, and Rodney prays for him, and he gets slain in the spirit for like hours. He, could, he literally could not move his body. And so he gets up, and um, I think this night, <laughs> once he gets up, he's, um, him and his team walk back to the hotel, and they're all drunk that night. It's like walking down I think, um, the street, just like a bunch of drunk people walking back to their hotel room, but they were just so overwhelmed with God. And um, then the next night, or this was like the night before they left, and um, Ronnie decided to do something he doesn't normally do. He said, you know what, tonight I feel like tomorrow night, um, I actually feel like God wants me to pray for every person here. There's like 2,000 people at the meeting. And so he was actually going to pray for every single person. So um, Randy's like, okay, I'm going to go get some more before I leave. And so <laughs> during this service, it's so funny. Like at first he was just kind of observing uh, Rodney. And he would follow Rodney around. And eventually Rodney was just like weirded out by Randy. Like, because Randy was just like wanting to see what he was doing. You know? Because he was just... Randy was just hungry. He was just desperate for God. And so then that, that night, um, Ronnie was praying for everybody. So um, Randy goes, gets prayer, gets slain in the spirit, gets back up, and he's like, i got to have more. So he would run onto the other side of the room, and he had glasses on, and he'd pull his glasses off because he didn't want Ronnie to know that it was uh, him in prayer again. And so Ronnie prayed for him again. He'd fall out. He'd get back up. And he would run back and forth to the other side of the room and like straighten his shirt, like stand down. He did it three times. And then he ran back over to the other side of the room. And the fourth time, I, I believe Rodney's brother noticed what was happening. And he's like, 
you are hungry. So he pulls him up and he's like, oh, finally I have permission. So anyhow, Randy is completely transformed. And he takes it back to his church. And this church that was so dull that he just hated going to, God just started showing up there. And, <clears throat> and so anyhow, um, at the same time, uh, John and Carol are not, who are the key leaders of the Toronto outpouring. Um, they're in Canada. And they were also so hungry, so desperate for God. So they would get up every morning for like an hour and a half praying that God would bring revival. And they um, were so hungry that they went down to Argentina. But how long has the Argentina revival been going on? 60 years, okay? So they go to Argentina and get prayer by this man named Claudio Frazier, who was over the Argentina revival. And then and he prayed for him, and they were, and he was like, take it. And so they took it, you know? And um, they get back home just still wanting more of God, and they're part of the Vineyard Movement, which came out of the Jesus Movement. And um, they heard that Randy and his, they heard about Randy's church and how Randy had just gotten so um, transformed because Randy also was part of the Vineyard Movement. So John calls up um, Randy and, and invites him up to Toronto and says, Hey Randy, I want you to come up for four days and just minister and let's just see what God is doing. You know, I just, we just believe that God's going to do the same thing for us up here that He's doing in your church. And <clears throat> Randy was like, Well, we have one. He's like, I'm going to bring somebody with me because I have a testimony have one message, so we'll just see what God does, because he was supposed to be there for four nights. So Randy goes up to um, Toronto. Are you talking with me? I'm talking fast. I'm trying. <laughs> um, okay, so Randy goes up to Toronto, and a couple days before, he started doubting God, um, and he was just like, I don't even know if God's going to move. Um is he going to use me up there? Am I going to go and nothing going to happen? So he's just so afraid. And then, then the day before he left, someone gave him a call, gave him a prophetic word. Um, and and he, in the prophetic word, God said to test him. And so that prophetic word literally just like went in and healed his heart, just completely transformed him. And he was like, all right, I can do this. I'm going to test God. And so, um, yep. So Randy goes up. Um, to Toronto, and the revival basically started with 120 people in, at, in Toronto. But Randy was gone for four days, and he's in for six weeks. So God just really started moving. And this um, was in, I believe, in January um, 1994. By November 1994, they had moved to. Um, this airport. Do you, a lot of you know about the Toronto airport? Okay. So, um, the, the Toronto airport, which is where they still are meeting. And, um, yep. So people began lining up and waiting outside and were coming from all over the world. It actually made, um, the media, I, I think it was actually on Phil Donahue. Um, <laughs> does anybody remember Phil Donahue? Like, long time ago. Um, and they dubbed it the Toronto Blessing. More than two million people visited the Toronto Blessing. And it was known for um, laughter, power. There was so much inner healing. Um, people would just come and worship and, and be in the services and trauma would leave their body. Um, people would be slain in the spirit, have to be carried out all the time. And, um, yeah, the families would be restored. I remember watching a video, and you can watch a lot of these videos on YouTube. I would encourage you to do it. I just get so ministered to you just going back and watching. Um, it's part of our history. And there was this one video where this lady goes, when I got here, I hated my husband. I just really didn't like him. And then she goes, and God just came and, look at my baby. I just love it. And I was like, to God and, <laughs> so it was amazing. 
so many families restored through that. I mean, that was a common testimony. Families are just getting restored. Um, and one of the things that I really um, admire about that is that John and Carol still to this day do ministry together as a couple. You always see them going and ministering as a couple. And I, just, I feel like that that's the heart of the father, um, husband and wife doing it together as a team. So that is the Toronto blessing. Now, Brownsville Revival, which is what we came from. Um, so, again, it all ties in together. So John Kilpatrick was the pastor of the Brownsville Assembly of God. And um, every Sunday, their church would meet together and pray for revival. Well, they heard about what was going on in Toronto, but John's mother was sick. And so... Um, he sent his wife, Brenda, up to Toronto to check out what was going on. Because they were just so hungry, they wanted revival. And so, Brenda goes up to um, Toronto to check it out. And this, after service one night, what they do is, um, in Toronto, they would line everybody up on a, uh, a piece of tape. And like Dave said, during this movement, like they would have other people praying for them. So it wasn't just John and Carol every night. So, um, John... Patrick's wife, Brenda, was on the prayer line, and this little old lady came up to her and said, Honey, what do you want? Um, honey, what do you want from God? And she said, Well, I'm a pastor's wife, so I just need more of him. I just want to touch, touch from God. And, she, and then, so this little old lady just said, Okay. And so she put her hand above, uh, just above Brenda's head, didn't even touch her, just put her hand above it. And when she did that, Brenda describes it as like a torch of fire that just went all the way through her body, all the way down to her toes, all the way back up again, up and down, and then she fell out and was sleeping in the spirit for a really long time. So Brenda gets up um, and comes home. It happened to be a Sunday when she came home, so she went straight to the prayer meeting at the church, and um, John saw her come in the back door, so he went and ran and met her. And John says when he saw her, he stopped. Because when he looked at her, at her in her face, she was just glowing with the glory of God. And her hair was really blonde at the time, but it was almost like white. Like she just was carrying the very presence of God. And so, <clears throat> and so, um, then John tells a story of how for most of his married life, for 50 years, um, his wife got up before the work of dawn and prayed. So this is just the, the life of Brenda Kilpatrick. She would get up at daylight every day with her Bible and a box of Kleenexes and would spend her entire morning just worshiping God. John would go to church and um, come back and he would often find Kleenex all over the room and she's still sitting there just in the, I love you God. We worship you just lost in the glory of God. And one day, John came home, and he's, um, he got home really early, and so he heard, he heard this movement upstairs. So he goes, and he's like standing in the doorway, and he sees his wife, who he'd been married to for years, just dancing before the Lord, and he said it was just the most pure and beautiful thing. And you know what it did? It caused a hunger in him, that he was just not satisfied. And he wanted that. So he called his elders and said, we've got to have a meeting. And so that night on the way to the elder meeting, John and Brenda were sitting. They decided to go have dinner at a diner. So they were sitting there, and he was getting ready to pray for the food. And he looks back up at his wife again, and her face again was just glowing with the glory of God. And he just breaks down, just wailing at the table. It was just, he said it was just so embarrassing. It was just like wailing. But Brenda looks at him and looks at him and just starts laughing and the spirit just pointing. And so she's laughing and he's wailing and she's laughing and he's wailing. <laughs> and then within three months, within three months from that day, on um, Father's Day, 1994, um, the Brownsville Revival began. And one thing that I would say about John is he was a hungry man too, and he would often go to the church 
um, late at night all by himself, and he would walk the pews of the Brownsville Assembly of God, and he would just say, God, God, there has to be more. God, there has to be more. God, there has to be more. And one day when he was laying there screaming that, he heard Jesus say, John, if you keep going after me, you'll find me. These are just people who went before us were hungry. And no speed bill, no boundary can stop them. So what she just said right there was an invitation for you right now. I know we have time, it's getting close. That all these stories combined, and then you, you fast forward that, and then you have a Bethel begin to emerge. I visited Brownsboro Bible School of Ministry. The week I visited for the very first time, they said, we have some visitors here from Redding, California that are checking it out because they're about to their own school. And then Chris Ballas and several people walked by me. I had no idea who they were at the time. And I was back in the school a year later, and look at what's happened with BSSN now, which translates to who's on the list. So that influences the birth of Beth Atlanta, which is where we're at right here, right now. Four. Five nutrients of revival. From every Bible I've, I've studied, it has these five elements. First one's prayer. The second one is expectancy. We'll talk about that. Um, just real quick, we got the comment. Expectancy. The third one's awareness. The fourth one is love for the people and love for the land. And the fifth one is abandonment. When I was at Browns for Revival School of Ministry, I would wake up in the morning with this awe factor. What's going to happen today? <clears throat> Yesterday I was at Revival and I couldn't see the front of the building because the glory cloud was so thick. It looked like, like 500 showers were on full blast with steam going. Revival is kind of characterized for two, or Browns was characterized kind of with two things. That was repentance and presence. My first time in there, I'm standing, watching what's happening. People are getting prayed for. All of a sudden, something felt like water and wind came up from behind me, and I lost my balance. But I was standing next to the sound booth when I caught my arm in the sound booth before I hit the floor. I turned around to see what was happening, and John Pope Kilpatrick was at the back wall just walking by, praying for people. And he got... He got 20 feet away from me and I could barely stand up. Because when no one was looking, he was getting up at 4 a.m. and saying, God, there's more! There's got to be more! I used to, when I was 19, I just, when I got saved, man, it, it, was, it was radical. It was a radical shift. I told you a little bit of that. I feel the urge just come up here. But it was radical. <sighs> I would drive to our church in the middle of the night. We had this crazy prayer guard. And I would just stare at the stars for hours and hours. I had no idea how long I was out there. It was like 30 degrees. And I would do it night after night after night. And it sounded cool, but I, there was something inside of me that said, keep going, keep, learn, keep learning, keep pressing in. I had to be close. I had to be close to men like Steve Hill, Steve Hill and John Kilpatrick. After I went down to the school, I knew I had to go back. I had to absorb all of that I could. It's like Randy going around and around and around. I did the same thing at Brownsville. Brownsville didn't have fancy lines. It was it was the press that you talked about with Jesus. And there's so many people like you couldn't form lines, and everyone's pressing together, and people are just kind of going through the crowd praying for people. And you would fall out. There's thousands of people around you. Hopefully you didn't step on your face, right? So play that real quick. I'm going to show you guys a clip from Browns Ball. If something's pricking your heart, I'll wait for one here. Let's do that. I know some people have to leave. Uh, what if you 
heaven and let Jesus go through the glory and the dark.